Hey, what's up, folks? How's everyone doing? Welcome to the stream. Uh, this is episode two of Diagnose Your Chest. This is a new show I'm doing with CoachS.com and Chess24, uh, where I work with a new player every week, uh, and we discuss their, their chess, and we look at some of their games, and we try to figure out how they can improve for the future. So my guest for today's episode is uh, Scott Harkema. And uh, Scott, why don't you tell everyone, um, maybe let's start with how old you are and where you're from. Cool, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I am 28 years old um, and I live in Philadelphia right now. Um, previously lived in Columbus, uh, just moved here less than a year ago. Um, yeah, I've been playing chess for about four years and I've been playing tournament chess um, for about two years, so. Okay, hey, cool, so you started, how did you get into chess? Um, so I, I'm in a, a graduate program, actually um, at uh, Ohio State University and um, hmm. started just like playing with people around the office, um, downtime and stuff like that. And, and yeah, started a bit more phone on some and stuff like that and um, started I guess I discovered the world of online chess after that and started playing a lot online um, and then maybe a year or so after that registered for my first tournament um, and yeah I've probably paid, played about 80 tournament games since then. Okay cool um, so yeah our, our connection's a little bit um fuzzy so we didn't get quite get all of that but it sounds like you, okay you've been playing tournament chess for about two years um you're mostly playing online for for the first uh couple of years and yep. uh did you say what kind of tournaments did you play in? was that in philadelphia uh that was actually in, in columbus oh, okay. um i was playing uh I, I guess i started with like one of these typical uh weekend um classical tournaments two games a day um, so I've played some of those and then I've been playing in some day long events, um, as well as rapid tournaments at, at the, the chess club and such, obviously haven't been playing very much, uh, the last nine months or so. Yeah. Um, but before, I was pretty active trying to play, um, once or twice a month. Once you're t got it. Yeah. So what, what was, um, what was your last rating then before the pandemic? In 70, I think. Um, yeah. 1670, uh, USCF. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, and what have you been doing lately? Like, have you been working on your chess a lot during the last several months? Um, kind of on and off. Um, I've been trying to, uh, work on like calculation and stuff like that with success. And most of mostly what I um, and analyze my games um, had a little experiment with the puzzle rush kind of thing, uh, but that didn't take that very far. Um, so mostly just like yeah, doing doing as many tactics as I can um, and, and playing long games. Okay, gotcha. And how often or how long would you say you're working on your chess um, on a weekly basis? So I kind of aim for uh, ten hours a week. Um, whether I actually hit that, you know, some weeks I end up just playing blitz and not really working that often. <laughs> um, a good week, 10 to 15 hours. Cool. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's maybe get into some of your games. So you sent me a bunch of your games. I didn't really play through them much. Just wanted to get them in and, and see them fresh, uh, for sure. the show. Um, but tell us a little bit about these games. Like these are, uh, recent online games. Are they, yeah, um, that, mm -hmm. uh, the, 
I, I think I sent you six games of those. Um, five of them are recent, like games, uh, most of which I found through the Chess Dojo. Um, and then I sent you one game from a few back against an international master. Uh, at least 50, uh, 45 plus 30. Um, I have to admit, I don't love playing classical chess online, um, but I've been trying to do it uh, to sort of, yeah, exercise my chess muscles. Right. Yeah, it can be, it can be tough to stay focused for the whole, the whole time. Uh, I totally feel you. Um, yeah. I feel, I find I to, to blitz mode um, quickly when I'm playing online and I, yeah. Right. Yeah, you got to make sure to use the time, especially, yeah, if you have 45, 30 or 60, 30, you got to really like you try to use the most of your time, especially if you have a critical moment, like right out of the opening, you're playing some sharp position. You might have a situation where like, yeah, you have a lot to think about, a lot to calculate, and you want to make sure you're, you're trying to like make uh, precise moves. So, um, yeah, do you want to start with this first game here uh, that we have loaded in? This was a uh, Sicilian. This was the this was a quick game. This was a rapid game. Oh, rapid game. Okay, let's jump to maybe let's jump to a slower game. Okay. Um. Is there is there a game you would want to to start with? So the one that's freshest in my mind is the one I played yesterday against um julio 88 hmm. yeah yeah this was a 90 30 um game okay cool and are you playing white or or black i'm playing white okay All right, let's take a look. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about your opening, Scott. So what are you what are you trying to do with white? Are you often playing knight f3, g3, or mixing it yeah, up? Yeah, so I I used to be an e4 player um, and then quit playing e4 mainly because of e4, e5. Um, when I was a bit lower rated, I, I played a lot of the king's gambit um, and then decided after a few bad tournament losses that it was time to try something else. And um, I'm somewhat averse to learning theory. And so I didn't want to go for like the Rui Lopez or the Italian or something. Uh, and eventually just like sort of grew sour of trying to play against E5. Um, and so uh, I switched to playing F3, because you avoid uh, uh, against E5 um, for Sicilian. Um, but uh, if they I play like, like a cat. Um, so that's that's what's happening here. OK, sorry, Scott. The, um, the audio is just kind of coming in real. Um, Real slow. Maybe you could try like turning down the quality of your webcam if you can, or like um, actually, if you need to, you just turn the webcam off altogether. Okay. Cause, yeah. Because um... the audio is honestly more important. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, let's see if that helps. Um, if not, I have another internet connection that I can try if this one's not working, but. Okay, well, I hear you right now, so... Um, okay, let's try this. And let me know, yeah, obviously, let me know if it if it acts up again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, all good. Um, no, okay, it seems to be working. So, um, yeah, I guess, so what I picked up was that you don't really want to deal with uh, E4, E5 as white. Yeah. Um, and you would rather play, I guess, more of a closed system with, like, Knight F3 and, and D4. So, are... 
is there a particular reason you're starting with knight f3 versus like starting with d4 c4 as a lot of players you know obviously are going to do um so some of it is that i you know i played some king's indian attack style stuff where um mm -hmm. Won't push any of my center pawns for a few moves, and then we'll play d3, e4 eventually. Mm. Um, I don't know. I've experimented with a lot of things. I, I mean, my I'm not super thrilled with my opening repertoire, to, to be honest. I, I think I crafted it on the basis of just trying to get my opponents out of the book as quickly as possible, um, because I, I don't want to be destroyed out of the opening. But I don't really play... Uh, especially as white, I don't play very aggressively out of the opening, um, like trying to realize a, a, an advantage as white. I'm more just sort of like playing these quieter systems where I try to keep pieces on the board mm -hmm. and, you know, wait for my opponent to slip up 20 moves later or something. So, Okay, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of like what you're kind of going for in the opening. And uh, yeah. So, right, in that sense, knight f3 is really a, a nice choice because it's quite flexible and you can do a lot of different setups. You can play with g3 and, like, with b3 and all kinds of stuff. Um, okay, so yeah. opponent goes for, I guess, like a Grunfeld. Um, and take, take, castles, rook b1. I guess <laughs> yeah, there's some... so this is like... A moment of madness, mm -hmm. just uh, just not not calculating, or not 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 thinking about my opponent's moves, and uh, just played rook b one. Right, you're gonna want to be yeah, like aware of your opponent's uh tempo moves for sure. Uh, yeah, I think main line here is like ninety five. Not that you really have to know the theory, but this is kind of one of the usual ideas here for okay. white just to like establish this knight on e5 and then if black plays like knight e4 <laughs> like following i think it doesn't work out because white takes on c6 first and then take on e4 and then black oh, spawns are weak so like bishop e3 or something and yeah you have some some nice targets here to attack um so yeah, that, that definitely feels like, yeah, kind of a, a clumsy move. Um, let's see, so h3, knight e4. Now black kind of goes in, starts to take over. Takes, takes, bishop e4. Your opponent's playing really well, actually. I mean, like, he goes knight e4, and then on g4 takes to get this e4 square for his bishop. Otherwise, he would have to go, go back. Yeah. Um, and for white here, we're... In a tough spot already because if you ever trade your light square bishops your king is going to feel feel pretty weak and black will hit you with like so yeah it's already actually like a really really difficult position kind of surprisingly yeah um yeah. my feeling is that h3 g4 didn't improve your position um do you remember kind of what you were thinking around this point like i mean i think it, yeah. so when i played h3 my my goal was like I need to kick the bishop out off of f5 somehow. And I was looking at, okay, should I play like knight h4? Then mm -hmm. he just retreats the bishop and my knight is on the edge. So I settled on this plan of playing um, h3, g4, but I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't very concrete. And so I didn't see that he could just play uh, knight e4 and then would be able to put the bishop on, on e4. So I, I think in the end, the whole plan is kind of a waste of time right well i guess you know here was really the critical moment because i think h3 is not so bad you know this move will be useful in different positions um it gives your king a square as well but g4 is a real committal one so g4 is the move where you gotta like stop and think and make sure that's like you know that's really what you what you want to do um not that your position honestly is like it does already feel quite difficult because black is this just positional threat of um taking on c3 and then mm -hmm. going like knight a5 and that's just very very straightforward and very annoying for us um but yeah i guess something like just moving the bishop out bishop e3 bishop f4 and then um well it's still like a the position is still very playable like black still has a lot of a lot of work to do there um so okay yeah things kind of go wrong quickly but 
you actually won this game, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I find that there's some, part. <laughs> uh -huh. like a lot of my results come from me um, playing really poorly in the game and then my opponent. Uh, even in long time controls, um, so uh -huh. I don't I don't know what that's about. Well, let's see um, what happens. I mean, I I'll tell you like you are relatively inexperienced. Um, I mean, for yeah, for a player who's like sixteen, seventeen hundred USCF, like I I don't think you've been playing that long, like only like two years in tournaments. Um, and so when you haven't been playing that long, obviously you haven't mm -hmm. seen a lot of chess, right? So there's all kinds of like little opening tricks and traps that it's not a matter of like, you know, if you're good at chess, you would just know this stuff. It's more like you just have to lose enough games to learn how to avoid uh, a bunch of random yeah. uh, ideas. Um, and yeah, usually that happens for us as, as kids, we just lose to all these traps and like we remember for the rest of our lives, like <laughs> what that's like. Um, I see. Yeah. So, Okay, so yeah, this game has some kind of like interesting turnaround. So right now, like black has some extra material, but the rook on a3 is potentially off sides. You're now centralizing everything. Queen is super active. Um, even if the engine doesn't like this move, queen c6, I think it is a good move because you're you're doing what you should be doing, which is like just trying to annoy the opponent as much as you can. Um, so this is definitely, I think, the right kind of this is what you should be doing, um, you know, whatever happens. And okay, at some point, yeah, black makes a mistake, queen f6, and now we're just like winning. Nice. E4. Yeah, oh, that, was, that was quite proud of that. that oh, trick. nice. Very nice. Wow. That's a nice trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Okay, so yeah, basically got caught a little bit in the opening, then you're on your back foot. One bad move, g4 made things worse. Um, but then, I mean, well, Black showed why why chess is a hard game. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it, it feels like everything should have been fine for Black, but one mistake and I think this was it, yeah. All of a sudden, uh, things turned around. Uh, cool. Let's look at um, another one. Sure. Uh, any game you want to look at, like if you feel like you struggled in the opening or you weren't sure what to do at one point. Um, probably the game. I, I don't know. Honestly, any of them. Maybe the one against chess games. Mm hmm. Yeah, chess games was in the chat earlier. <laughs> so <laughs> take a look. Uh, okay, and you are playing white or, or black? Um, I am playing black here. Okay, let me flip the board. Okay. So you played the, uh, I guess, the Kalashnikov. And uh, yeah, well, let's talk about your your black openings. Is this your your main repertoire? Yeah, so Sicilian is black, um, the Kalashnikov, and then the main. Yeah, I I, I have this little move um, f five, which is kind of the move that gets everyone out of book, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's sort of easy to get people into this. Um, set up if you play the Kalashnikovs, so it's like all very forcing. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'd say I'm reasonably comfortable with this opening. Okay, cool. And then what are you playing against D4? Uh, uh, Kings Indian. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so right, this F5, this is an interesting idea in this opening. It definitely uh, has, has, a right, has a right to exist. Um, and in particular, Rajabov, I remember, really likes these kinds of positions uh, as as black. So this is a cool one to to play. Takes takes here castles. Yeah, it feels like you feel pretty comfortable here. 
like you got out of the opening with okay reasonable position um but a strong player yeah will kind of like punish you on the light squares here they'll put the bishop on e4 and yeah black suffers a little bit so this is a position where like if white is playing well as black you really have to uh play quite precisely not to fall worse yeah because you have these like long-term uh weaknesses but but it's a very playable system and um yeah like takes d5 and wow all of a sudden you're doing quite fine nice so right this shows kind of like yeah the pr practicality of the opening um so here here four Takes. I guess you missed a win here with queen d8. Yeah, oh, yeah missed a little trick. Huh. And uh, I guess white is just losing a piece. Wow, that's kind of surprising. Take, take here, c5, <laughs> what a bluff by white, <laughs> here, here. Uh, now white is like, yeah, back in control, takes f4, wait, not sure. Yeah, there was some nuance with, oh, bishop I think he gave the pawn because he was worried about bishop f8. Right. But I guess he has this amazing move, bishop c6. Yeah, that's that's easy easy to miss. So if white finds this, he keeps keeps a big advantage. But yeah, otherwise it looks like you're losing your queen, so he tries to get out. F4. Trade queens. Yeah, this is again. this is where I I have I have like some kind of questions about what I should have done here, mm -hmm. um, because I I think I was playing too quickly, um, and all of a sudden his rooks were on the seventh rank and I was like much worse. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess um, this was kind of your last chance. I guess the secret is you have to like challenge the rooks immediately. Um, so if you trade one pair of rooks, then your your king is pretty safe. Uh, with both rooks on the board, of course, yeah, he can just double up on the seventh rank, and there's a ton of potential. Especially with the bishop covering g8, he's just mating you on h7. So that's that's really dangerous. Um, so usually the idea is we just try to challenge. Let's say white stays uh, on on the seventh somewhere, like rook b7. Um, then I feel like we need like counterplay with like d3 or something. At least that would be my like first instinct. And then can okay, we have bishop d4 check? And here we're kind of using tactics to keep him from getting to the uh, the seventh rank. I see. Um, it's just a really sharp position. So it's like yeah, we're going to be relying on tactics here to kind of figure out our our problems. Um, if we had all the time in the world, it would be nice to kind of like challenge the rook on the seventh rank like putting a rook on c8 and then bringing the other rook to to c7 but yeah it really kind of depends on what white uh what white plays there because our deep one is also annoying and if we can just secure this deep one on d2 well then okay then we're fine right because white's second rook will never will never come down uh to the seventh rank um so yeah, kind of surprisingly gets like gets really bad uh, really quickly. Um, so yeah, here, here, and right now it's just. I guess you have to give the exchange.
white trace rooks, which is yeah definitely good from a technical point of view. You now it just simplifies the position and um, finds a way to to win. But, I mean, really interesting game overall, like, very fighting, and, I mean, Chess Kings is a strong player, so. Um, yeah, really interesting one. Um, I just wanted to play through the opening one more time, just. Yeah, I guess the engine really hates this move, B5, for some reason. So maybe that's yeah. worth uh, analyzing just just for a bit, because um, b5 is very thematic in these positions to stop knight c4. Um, right. The, yeah. This was where I, I think I, I took a few minutes because I've never seen this knight d5 move before mm -hmm. after um, taking on f5. So, um, but yeah, my my main thought was just to stop stop bishop c4. Or sorry, knight c4. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe it's too slow or something. I don't know. Yeah, it's always curious. Um, and yeah, I always like investigating whenever the engine says something like kind of unusual. Because to me, b5, yeah, it does feel very thematic. A knight d5 is an interesting move because it well it tries to get the knight the other knight into the game as well with uh, like c3 or c4 and then then bringing the knight back. Um, so. I guess the issue is bishop d3. Let's say you pulled back. And uh, I guess c4 would be the problem if there was one. By trying to just open things up very quickly. So if we take, I guess bishop takes probably. And then we have some problems on the uh, light squares. Um, so I could see I could see why black would be worse here. It doesn't it doesn't really feel great. On the other hand, if you go knight f6, let's say white goes bishop c4. Wow, even knight e7. Hmm. Which I'm not really sure because of takes on f6. We would want to check this position for a second and make sure that like this is kind of okay, but like, okay, queen h5, we have bishop g6. We got a big center, we have d5. It looks, it looks a little terrifying, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And like, right, if this move, for example... Oh, then d5, and black just starts to, like, take over. Queen d7, other bishop comes out, rook g8. Um, so... Okay, a little surprising, but like, well, this op <laughs> this opening is, is quite like it's quite adventurous. So sometimes that's the kind of position you you kind of get yourself uh, into. Um, but I don't I don't mind it for sure. Um, I think it's an interesting choice as long as you like believe in it and you believe in the ideas. Then it's that's kind of what it's all yeah. about. I would say this is probably my this is the opening I think I'm the happiest with. Um, and probably enjoy the most success with. I think I have like a lot more questions about like with white, should I be trying to learn more theory like to progress as a player or should I just keep relying on like beating my opponents once I get them out of book because that doesn't seem to always be going so well. Um, and then and then I, the, the King's Indian is just... Um, yeah, I, I don't roll with it and don't line. Uh, so. Wait, can you repeat that? What are you saying about the King's Indian? Oh, the King's Indian, I just feel like I don't have, I just don't know the lines. Uh, I know, I know up through move like, you know, eight, and I know a couple of systems at that point, but I don't, don't really have something I feel like super comfortable with. Um, and there's just so many different things white can do against it that I don't know how to play against, so. Right. Um, well, with the King's Indian in particular, with other openings, what I would say is 
that it's yeah really just about knowing uh some of the structures and what you're hoping to achieve um do you have uh do you have a king's indian game in in the list we could look at I actually don't have one in this list. Um, nobody's mm -hmm. been playing D4 against me recently. That's okay. We can um, just look at a couple of random positions. Like, if there's anything, actually, that you're sure um, unsure about, we can we can definitely talk about it. But, right, I guess what you and a lot of players will say is that there are a lot of options. Like, in this position in particular, um, there's, like, H3 and F3 and Bishop E2 and Bishop E3. Well, bishop I actually E5. don't have the board in front of me. Oh, is it not? Um... Let me see. Let me try now. Okay, I think I have it now. Yeah, it's on d6 for you? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so in this position, white has like a, a bunch of different options. And then, of course, there are options like without pushing e4. And, and basically against all of them, you kind of have to figure out what you're doing to attack the center yourself. Like, are you playing with e5 or with c5? Um, and against a lot of these lines, both moves will be playable. It's just a matter of like following it up uh, correctly. So, so my recommendation would just be to try to get your hands on as many Kings Indian games as possible. Even choosing like one player and looking at all of their games is often a great idea because it's like you get a picture as to how they approach the opening. Um, especially someone like the Kings Indian, there are like many different ways of of playing it. A lot of players will play e5. And e takes d4 in every position. Some players will play c5 in every position, treat him more like a Benoni. Um, mm -hmm. And you might be able to find a player that like you really kind of appreciate how they approach the opening, and then you, you just kind of model what they do because they, they've already done the work for you. Everything they play is gonna be like, you know, computer checked somewhat, like it's not gonna be losing <laughs> outright. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of great Kings Indian players out there that you can uh take a look at. So if like Few of the big ones are like Nakamura and and Rajabov, but uh, I would actually recommend finding like a twenty six hundred player because the twenty six hundred GMs that like play the Kings Indian like they got to play it for a win. They have to play it against other GMs. Like they're they really have to work at it a lot. So guys like Gawain Jones, uh, Raf Mamedov is another like really good Kings Indian player. Uh, Smirin, of course, is is a big one. Um, so yeah, finding one of these guys and just kind of like studying them, uh, and, and studying how they approach the different openings. I think that will just give you an idea of what you're, uh, playing for. Um, and turn the engine on when you look at their games and you'll see like, they're going to be losing in a lot of their games, but somehow they like find a way to come back, create the counter play, find the king side attack and win. It's very remarkable. Actually, some of these players are just like down plus two plus three the whole game, but then they, they win every time. <laughs> So it can be can be inspiring too, actually. <laughs> um, okay, so that's. I so I actually have a question about. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I have a question about about uh, like studying master games. It's not something that I've really worked into my training at all to this point. Mm -hmm. um, whether that be for openings or just like for the entire game, it sounds like maybe I should be doing that. Yeah, I would say that's one of the best things you could do when it comes to trying to like improve your own understanding of a specific position like that comes out of the opening um is like looking at a player's games and then like trying to understand their decisions why they played one move ahead of another move um and i i guess the most valuable part of it is just comparing what they did with what you would do in a game so the way I would recommend is like playing through a game and just kind of keeping a running tally. Like every time you see a position, like it's, you know, you're looking at it from Black's point of view, just thinking like, okay, well, I would probably make this move here. I would probably go this move and then see what they play, try to understand it. Um, and most importantly, uh, try to like stay engaged and, and ask questions like, because a lot of things will be left kind of um, unanswered. So for example, uh, we'll have some random game, Knight of three, castles bishop e2 uh black goes e5 uh and then actually just very very basic question here like white castles here and then this one actually just gets asked all the time like in the chat like well, why can't white just take and win a pawn a lot of times mm -hmm. this isn't really addressed in the book because like every king's indian player already knows this so it's like 
the author doesn't want to just repeat like basic stuff, but you might not know it and you might not know a lot of stuff that's left unanswered. But by asking the question, then you force yourself to look at the position. And then, you know, if you can't figure it out on your own, you can always ask the Oracle, the Oracle. And I recommend that you do um, when you just can't figure it out yourself. Um, and then, okay, it shows you, well, here black can trade queens and then take on e4 and win back the pawn. And like, now, you know, now you just know that idea forever. Right. Um, so, well, not forever, you know, you should repeat it a couple of times, but you, you get the idea. Um, so basically you're just trying to understand what happened, you know, why were the moves played as they were played? Why were other moves, you know, not played? And, um, I don't know. I honestly, I just try to take away like maybe three ideas from each game. I mean, one game can have tons and tons of instructive ideas, but it, it's hard to like remember everything. But if you try to just take away like three key points or three moves that kind of stuck out to you. Um, and, you know, for instance, if you save the games in like a database that you reviewed from time to time, you would retain, I think, almost all of the ideas that you that you look at. Um, do you have a, do you have a physical board? Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you use it? <laughs> uh, not as often as I, as I ought to. Um, I well, typically, I'm not like setting up positions on it or when I'm playing my long games, I've, I've tried to use the physical board, but it becomes a bit tedious. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, really only for tournament play or, or skittles or whatever. Well, nowadays it's, it's tough. Um, but yeah, when you're, getting back into like tournaments and tournament games and i i presume you want to play like otb after after the pandemic is kind of over um yeah any kind of like over the board practice i think is going to be useful uh, especially actually calculation over the board because i think for most players calculating online is different uh to calculating on a physical board and so you know if you're going to be playing six hour games otb where you're calculating like yeah you got to kind of practice uh the otb calculation so for you and for most people i would just recommend trying to do like like 45 minutes an hour otb uh calculation or at least like working with the board it doesn't have to be like you're trying to solve puzzles it could just be like you're playing through a game and just kind of casually analyzing it trying to look at different lines different variations just trying to like uncover some uh some ideas sure um, and then for mm -hmm. playing through those long, for, for playing through master games, do you recommend finding them in like a book collection or something like that? Or is it okay to just find any old, find somebody on the database and download a bunch of their games and, and work through them on, on your own without any analysis? Yeah, I think, I think both approaches are, are fine. If you're, um, if you're like motivated enough, right. And you, you have one player you really like, for example, Nakamura is like a King's Indian, you know, genius. I think every King's Indian player should study Naka's games. Um, his games are really complicated, but they're not really, I don't think there is a source where they're all annotated. So you would just have to, yeah, download them from the database yourself, play through them one by one, and just try to understand what happened and, and pick up as many ideas as you could. Um, there are some good King's Indian books out there, like Smirin's book, um, King's Indian Warfare, I think is really good. And that has a mix of his own games and uh, just well-known King's Indian games that he, you know, finds instructive. Um, so that I think is like a great source. Generally, I don't know. I do appreciate the annotated stuff more because they kind of show you the gold. You don't really have to uncover it yourself. Um, but it might be even more beneficial to analyze the games on your own. And and like I've I've kind of done both. So. You know, it's um, it's hard to go wrong here, actually. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, let's maybe look at another game. Um, yeah. yeah. How about a game where you're white? Maybe one. The oh, username is k-h. Oh, yeah, we just have this one. That's right. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, so for this one, you go back into E4. Yeah, so I, I feel somewhat comfortable playing against the Sicilian 
Um, so, like I said, the main reason I, I avoid e4 straight away is because I don't like to play e4, e5. And if you play knight f3 first, you don't have to worry about that. Um, but against other first moves, uh, particularly c5, I'll, I'll, I'll play e4. Gotcha. And do you like uh, playing against the Sicilian? So I... I I played the the Rosalimo a bit and had some success there. I don't I don't really know the lines or the theory, but um, I've had some success with that. I I've also played um, some of these weird D three Sicilians that turn into sort of a King's Indian attack and had success with those. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also experimented with the Wing Gambit uh, a bit. With, I've had success, but, uh, but yeah, I, I feel comfortable uh, playing some of it. But like I say, in this game, I don't really know what to do. Um, hmm. Okay, well, let's, let's see. So we get kind of like, yeah, King's Indian attack. Um, close position. Basically reverse King's Indian. Knight h4, and so, okay, you're right here, didn't want to allow f5 without being able to meet it with f4. So on f5, you want to go immediate f4? So, oh, sorry, one more time? Yeah, that was my, that was my intention. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, it might not be the right idea here. And if black doesn't go f5, then are you playing f4? Probably not. I don't know. Interesting. I mean, okay. I kind of tunnel, I like tunnel visioned that, oh, my opponent for sure, he's going to play f5 on the next move. What am I going to do about this? And came up with this idea without really thinking through what else he could do after I played knight. Um, yeah yeah so generally we, we definitely want to make moves that are like helpful um for our position regardless of what the opponent is going to do right because yeah. isn't it's almost like a, a trappy move like um yeah you're just hoping for this this one response uh the funny thing is i actually think you should be playing for f4 in this position because oh, okay. this this is kind of the only way to um to to get both your rook and your your bishop in involved in a more meaningful way. Um, so this move knight h4, I think it, it could be okay if it's kind of like uh, followed up correctly, but if it's purely a prophylactic move, then yeah, it's a big no-no because it's like your knight's just on the side of the board and then black can just ignore it for as long as they want to and uh, it's not gonna contribute in the center. Um, mm -hmm. So something more flexible like rookie one here would be uh, fine or knight d2 to c4, basically any of the the typical moves here. Um, even a4 is okay, just kind of like taking some space. And then I'll be up to black to see if they want to play d5 or, or d6. I guess in the game your opponent played d5, so they might go for this here as well. And um, I mean, to be honest, like you are kind of playing black at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Like a reverse King's Indian. And uh, it's hard to really fight for uh, an advantage here. You just really have to feel these um, positions. I think you can be a little bit more like ambitious in the opening while still avoiding theory. Um, so for instance, like, you know, you could play a lot of these open Sicilian positions and I think they're not uh, that bad. Um, but if you, if you don't want to play the open Sicilian, then I would say probably don't go for e4 because then you can probably get more like probably get more combative positions here with g3 or b3 um something that you're used to and actually that your opponent will be less used to because if you play against a sicilian player like they're usually going to yeah. know a lot of stuff even in the anti-sicilians they're they usually see this stuff a lot um so i i would say this is kind of yeah like straying from your approach a little bit um by by going for this one um, but let's see what happens. So d5 takes, takes, knight d2, knight c7, c4, bishop f6. 
Mm, so here, Ricky Yates, Queen D2. So you're not worried about Bishop takes H4. Yeah, I figured the the light square, or sorry, the dark squares would be too weak, um, and I would have good compensation for the the ruined pawn structure uh, in front of my king. Okay, that makes sense. So yeah, something like this. You go bishop g5. And um, yeah, you maybe have knight d6 coming, which is a pretty annoying move. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like this idea. Um, bishop e6. Then we go back. e4. Yeah, I missed this move Oof. when I was... Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, now it looks bad. Yeah, wow. So, right, my guess is here, I guess, f4 is what you probably need to do. Um, yeah, it feels really unnatural here for some reason. Oh, wait, no, like, f4 would... Sorry, that would be a blunder because bishop takes c4 and queen on d2 is... Oh, right, right. ...undefended. Maybe we had to play f4 like back here. For some, I have this like prejudice that I ought not push my pawn if e pawn is not on the board. Comes from feels that it opens up the position without getting like a strong center out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely like a, a double-edged move. You are weakening your king for sure. Um, but I think we kind of have to play this move because otherwise uh, otherwise you're lacking a little bit of space, especially if you end up going back like knight f3, then black just gets these two pawns, like e5, c5, like uncontested and full set of pieces. So our pieces are kind of going to be uh, stepping over each other. Um, when you play f4, you will basically open up the f-file for your rook and yeah, you... you it's a very aggressive way of playing because you're just trying to like open things up. You also can think about bringing the bishop back to f4 and then like using um, using this diagonal uh, as well in, in the dark squares. Um, but, but it just means that it, it's kind of a tough position because it's like you really have to follow up super, super aggressively to kind of make it work. Um, which probably means it's not the right position for you it's like a very like swashbuckling type of position where strategically we have to understand that white is worse right because of the the backwards d pawn right this is just like a chronic weakness that you don't really have compensation for you have to kind of create it in the form of activity which means that if everything just kind of stays normal and both sides develop their pieces without any conflict then black is just going to be super happy because you have this huge weakness on an open file and they don't have any weaknesses whatsoever. So, you know, white is just going to be worse at that point. So this opening really forces you to, to compensate for it by with active play. A similar opening is like the Benoni, which is really risky because black gets this kind of like weird structure, weak d6 pawn, but active play to compensate for it. And then they have to kind of uh, essentially make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and those openings are very playable, but they're really not for... Uh, everybody. I mean, personally, I I don't like them <laughs> myself because uh, it, it puts a lot of responsibility on you long term. Uh, I don't know. You play something similar with your Kalashnikov because you have this weak structure from the get go, right. but your pieces are active. And if you feel comfortable there, then maybe it is something that you can uh, you can do. But just to show is like a typical example of this in the in the regular King's Indian. Of course, Black has to make this choice here, where some players will just go e takes d4 and play this structure as black with rook e8, white goes f3, and eventually black plays c6. Uh, and here again, the d6 pawn is a real weakness and it's going to be weak the whole game, but black relies on their piece play to kind of make up for it. Hmm. Um, but if you don't want this one, then you have other options. And of course, black can go like knight c6 here, which is like the main line. There's knight d7 and knight a6. And they all have their pros and cons, but Essentially, we want to be a little bit um, uh, conscious of like the types of positions we're getting and whether they're fitting 
what we're trying to achieve, right? Like, do we want a solid position where we can slowly put pressure or do we want kind of like a really risky position that's very like double-edged? Um, yeah, it feels like I'm throwing a lot at you. <laughs> no, it makes sense. Okay, okay, good, good. It makes sense. I have, like, like uh, I haven't really, I used to be more of an ethical player played a lot of like games and tried to just open the position up and then decided that for my chest I needed to stop being solid um, and then uh, more recently have been sort of swaying back towards that sort of like more you know attacking in your face style of chess mm -hmm. and I mean I guess the goal is ultimately to be able to do both styles well um right but yeah i don't know at this point uh i don't identify with either so much gotcha um well yeah i mean that's um right how you progress from here will be kind of based on which players you look at and you know model your your play after because you can definitely go a number of different ways um and I do think like a consistent approach is is probably the way to go because um, yeah, you kind of have to like chew something and, and stick with it for a while until you feel like, okay, it's really not working for you anymore and then and then maybe switching over. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll come down to just you know what kind of player you you yeah. want to be. I feel like, Yeah, I, so part of the problem is I think I would like to be this sort of attacking player, but um, but I feel like to do that, I need to play more aggressively in the opening, especially as white, and then mm -hmm. um, and then I need to learn a lot more theory. <laughs> so maybe that's just what I have to do, is just start learning how to play the open Sicilian or something like that, um, or start learning, yeah, how to play against e4, e5 but um from that just because again I, I i haven't wanted to spend a lot of time on that right i mean i i'm not sure you you do need to learn a lot of theory i think um you can play virtually any opening in an aggressive fashion so i would i would be cautious about that i mean maybe that is what you end up doing and that might be okay but I don't think that's necessarily the only way to to get there. Um, okay, but uh, but I hear what you're saying. So you can play Adeline in an style, or uh, or I don't know. Can't think of any other openings off the top of my head. But. Yeah, you you can definitely play the Catalan. Right, in, in an aggressive manner. I mean, there's a lot of like, like pawn sacrifices and in, in the variations and and in D four and closed openings. Like, yeah, they're definitely like sharp lines you can um, you can go for. Um, or you can also do it the way you've been doing it, with like starting with knight f three and then only playing e four if they go c five, which uh, a lot of players uh, do as well. Um, were you you were black in this game, right? Uh, which game is this one? This is against uh, Calvin Blocker. Yes, yeah. This is the the this is from a few months back. Uh, uh, simultaneous exhibition. Oh, gotcha. So this was a yeah. This is the one with the uh, international master. Gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think you play this one quite um, quite all right. I thought it was kind of a nice um, a nice effort. 
Uh, when you play Scott, do you feel like you are more of like a calculating player? Like you want to calculate everything or do you feel like you're relying more on like your intuition and in which moves feel right? So I, I have trouble actually understanding the distinction. <laughs> um, cause I feel like I do a lot of calculating at some, at some times. And then there are other times where I feel like I'm just sort of relying on intuition. I mean, I would, I would probably lean towards calculating just because I feel like I have so little experience in chess that I feel like I have to calculate everything. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I really fall clearly somewhere on, mm -hmm. on one of those. I mean, I remember in this game being like really like in the zone, just like um, trying to look at all of my opponent's possible moves. You know, I had the time because it was a simul and he's running around in different boards. Um, and that's why I felt so good about this game, I think, is because I was literally calculating everything. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know that that's consistent. Mm -hmm. across my games gotcha yeah just um just curious because you know there there are different ways to play so the difference would be like you know a player that relies on their calculation they uh they want to be sure before they do something like if they're going to sacrifice a pawn they want to see like exactly what they're going to get for it um or if they if they make an aggressive move they want to know exactly what they're going to do against all of their opponent's most critical responses. For instance, like if you make some aggressive knight move like knight g5, then a calculating player is going to be thinking about, um, well, like, well, what if my opponent goes, uh, well, my arrows are not working for me. Hmm. <laughs> so some move like bishop g5, they're going to be calculating, well, what if my opponent goes h6? Do I have a good response against this? And if not, then, well, I'm not going to play bishop g5. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. an intuitive player, like, kind of feels what they think is the right move, like, oh, I have to play f5 and open up the position, or I have to do this. And even if they're not, like, totally sure, they're still going to go for it, because they think it's like, this is the right choice. So once I get there, then I'll find the right move. Like, I don't see it right now, but I'm sure a move will come up that looks good, or something will work out in all of the uh, variations. Um, and different players have different styles. So, it, you know, you can kind of like um, model your approach in different ways. Um, a guy like uh, Kasparov, I think, was really heavily on the calculation side because he was like a machine, like super fast. And if you look at his annotations, it's just like lines and lines and lines and all the stuff he calculated. Um, Compare it to a guy like Shirov, another like great attacker, if you look at his book and his notes, it's going to be a lot more like intuitive. You know, he has stuff where it's like he calculated a couple moves and he was like, yeah, I'm sure I have full compensation here. And and he could calculate further and a lot of times he does, but it's like it's that, it's that evaluation that's kind of like uh, driving that kind of player. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just something to, to, to think about. I want to just quickly go through your other games as well. Let's see, there's this one against uh, Max. And are you playing, you're playing white in this one? Oh, or... so I was black in this one. Oh, you're so black here. Was a Kings in game. Oh, cool. Of right, sorts. so he kind of gets you into a perk defense. Um, which is a little bit different than the King's Indian because mm -hmm. he hasn't committed to c4. Which means that when yeah. White Castle's queenside, he's going to be a little bit safer. And so that's why it's a little bit more dangerous. Um, so this is, uh, okay, definitely a playable uh, position for Black. So Castles, he goes h4. Yeah, this kind of stuff is always hard to deal with. Um, I would say... My feeling in these positions is that I usually like to play h5 here and shut it down, as you did. Uh, I think this is the right the right choice. Uh, and you just try to control the g4 square. Um, okay, so queen d2, c5, d5, e6, bishop h6, b5. Um, well, it feels like you know what you're doing here. I mean, a6 is definitely 
uh, good plan. Did you feel comfortable in this position or, or no? Yeah, I mean, was still maybe a little bit scared, but um, but felt like, I mean, I know, I know you basically just have to get queenside counterplay. Um, and this seemed to be the way to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, right, and it doesn't seem like white has achieved much on the king side. Mm -hmm. So bishop f3, knight d7, knight h3, knight comes to e5. No, your position looks great. Uh, knight e2 takes. Oh, Jesse criticizes this move on stream. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I guess so. My feeling on this move is like, what's what's the rush? Actually, I don't get it. Yeah, I guess the bishop isn't going anywhere in in the near future, is it? Yeah, I guess. Well, you did play e five, so was this the idea just to try to get this e five move in? I was, but I think yeah. Oh, sorry. Can you repeat that? Yeah, it was that was part of the idea was to play e five. Gotcha. Okay. Um. Yeah, maybe not the right decision because it just gives White like this open uh, g file. Um, I guess he could have taken on Passant and gone knight g five, like, and then castles like everything kind of with tempo and. Yeah, this looks very dangerous. The other knight coming to. Uh, f4 here rook g1 and right now it just looks like black's king is very close to being um mated here yeah so kind of a, a wrong choice um what do you think you should have done instead do you have any ideas um maybe develop the light square bishop i don't see obvious square to develop it to. Um, um, move that could be worth playing. Um, but maybe knight c4, queen c3 or something. I don't know. I don't know. Then you just kick the queen around even more, perhaps. Yeah, I don't know. I... Or I could also just see continuing to advance the pawns on the queen side with either c4 or b4. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, hard to say what I would actually use. Yeah, there's um, yeah, there would be a couple options for for black. I think right, like bishop d7 seems okay. Push a5. Um, okay, one move I would be careful about playing is c4, just because um, that would allow white to bring their knight to the d4 square uh, mm. and, and kind of use this one. But yeah, we right, it's like white doesn't really have a lot going for them. They're going to have a very hard time getting g4 and basically impossible. And g4 is their only break. So right from like a strategic point of view, if we approach it from the sense that like white has only one idea here to play g4 and it's very very difficult to do so then yeah let's not help our opponent untangle let's just leave them to their mess and slowly just advance like a5 and yeah uh, i mean white's position is probably only going to get um worse you know most players they just end up making more weaknesses and yeah kind of uh crashing so um okay interesting interesting move here and i think this happens to a lot of players i mean it is a tempting trade mm -hmm. you, you really you really weaken their structure so castles b4 queen e3 here here c4 knight g3 five check takes on a2 wow this game was super crazy yeah Right, we were, um, I remember we were confused by one moment here. 
Yeah, why not just snap the queen off of e3? Uh, I guess I was just thinking that, you know, it's better... I think what was in my head was that it's better to have him take my queen and let me take with the rook on c3 than to take it and resolve his pawn structure myself. And I mean, I saw that I, you know, I could I could probably take it here, and and then my king is a lot safer. Um, but I guess I was thinking he also maybe wanted to trade queens here because his king isn't very safe. And so I just thought if I played rook c8, then he would take my queen and I would take with the rook and, and have pressure. I gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, generally, that's definitely not, not a bad idea. Like, you do want to kind of trade on your own terms. Um, this one was surprising for us because we felt like, yeah, I mean, once you, uh, once like f takes g6 happens, if we look at like who's attacking who here, black just has the queen and white has like the rook on g1, possibly the second rook, the queen on e3 is in position, the knight is ready to come to g5. It feels like black is the one that's like closer to just getting outright mated here. Um, you're also after c3 takes takes here. Um, I think you're... You're not up a pawn, but it's like, it feels like you could be up a pawn very easily. And you have this like past a pawn. Um, so like your rook might actually just be f very good on a8, actually just pushing your, your a pawn here. You don't even necessarily mm -hmm. need it um, on, on c3. But to me, yeah, this felt like a case of like, you know, maybe you have some nice move here. But from a practical point of view, when we're getting attacked and we have like a good... All the strategic factors are on our side, like in terms of the structure and number of pawns. That, yeah, I mean, like try to take any endgame you can get, really, um, because uh, it's just a lot less risk for you. Um, I mean, like, okay, the engine was saying, I think, like FG6, which to be fair, might be like totally winning for black, but from like human point of view, you know, there's like rook takes g6 immediately. You have to calculate queen g5 mm -hmm. moves that could just be killing you. You don't really know. But but we know if we trade queens, we're always playing for two results here. We're going to be very safe. And if we have a pawn and like some positional advantages, often this will be enough to to win the game. Because that will just lead to, to more punts and more advantages. Um, and here it seems like, yeah, you could take on g6. You don't have to worry about the sack anymore. Uh, and now the d5 pawn is hanging, or you could probably even take on d5, uh, yeah. knowing that if gf7, king f7, your king is again safe with the queens off the board, and your knight is now super active, and your rooks are ready to uh, to get in. Um, not that you win this for sure, but just uh, feels like that would be a more more practical choice. Yeah. Um, and then in the game, it seems like right things get kind of hectic. We do get the end game. Um, but white actually gets like a little bit more, right? A little bit, much more play actually than, than they deserved. Um, yeah. And this was a, this was like, I think kind of, this one totally comes down to just me ridiculously fast in the end game mm. not taking the to calculate anything eventually just yeah yeah you definitely want to still be staying concrete in the end game um because any one move can can change the evaluation of the position it's very easy to go from win to a draw draw to a loss win to a loss and, and so on um as far as the instincts go here, I would say you you definitely want to go active with the king, like king f5. Like all else being equal, if we're just guessing in every position, the active mm -hmm. king move is probably going to be right most of the time. Uh, so I would try to instill this uh, in your in your mind as much as you can. Like uh, when you have a choice, go active or passive with the king. Always just try to go active because the king will help your rooks. 
it'll help push your e-pawn, uh, be much more bothersome for white. Whereas on, on e7, I think you like, yeah, you immediately run into your own issues where white plays like rook g1 and uh, rook g7 coming. Because, uh, okay, yeah, I guess you had some some wins here according to the engine, but um, well, when I analyze games, you know, I try like, obviously what the engine says is very important, but uh, no one's going to find the engine moves <laughs> every time or even most of the time. So it's not really about, oh, you had a win or you didn't have a win. What I'm looking for is really just like uh, whether you made like good practical choices or not. Because of course you're not going to calculate uh, anywhere close to what the engine sees. But um, mm -hmm. if you just have this rule of thumb in your mind, like always go active, then you can find king f5 here, you know, regardless of, of uh, what the engine thinks. Um, but, uh, no, yeah, very, very interesting game again. Um, it's always fun to, to go through these games and see, see the turnarounds and stuff. Do you have a, so like, I feel like that happens to me in a lot of positions where I'll have like this kind of crazy game and somehow it resolves into an end game where maybe I feel like I have a, a small advantage. Mm-hmm. And then I won't win the end game. Uh, and I'll actually often lose the end game because I'll think that I'm winning and then I'll play very quickly because I'm excited and then um, make lots of mistakes. Right. Um, is I should like something I should uh, like remedy by studying more like rook end games or studying more minor piece end games? Uh, or is it like a mindset thing? Uh, it's it's definitely a little bit of of both. Um, like the the main book that's always recommended, I, I think, is just a really good one is uh, the book Endgame Strategy by Sharashevsky. Um, that just has a lot of like very classic uh, playable endgames. So it's not really about uh, any theoretical positions, like memorizing any like rook and pawn endgames or anything like that. That's important, mm -hmm. but that's not really what this is about. That just shows you how to play. Positions where like you have a small advantage, you're you're playing against one weakness, playing against two weaknesses. You have good knight versus bad bishop, or two bishops versus two knights. Um, kind of typical like small advantage end games. Um, so that's a really useful book to to study. But on top of that, really more than anything, it's just you have to learn to like sit on your hands basically <laughs> in the end game um because you and so many others and i mean myself and, and you know gms all the time like we're just constantly making end game mistakes uh that we don't necessarily need to some games are just very difficult you know you're not going to find the right end game uh, you're not going to find the right move but um there are lots of positions with like very avoidable mistakes where we just like rush and we just play too quickly and yeah you just have to like slowly and painfully like consciously like continue to remind yourself that like you know, there's always going to be more resources. The game is really not over until, like, the clock is stopped. Um, I mean, you have to be, like, yeah, you have to be so vigilant. Like, I'll show you one that was just so painful for me <laughs> from last year. But we'll revisit it because, I mean, it'll be instructive, I guess, for others. <laughs> um, but this is a game I had where, I like, I just blew it, you know, like, last last possible second when it was really, like, um, at its easiest point. But let me, um, yeah, I'll just quickly load the position here. And uh, I yeah, feel it's... like mm -hmm. I get these positions, or I'll, I'll get the end games, and I feel like I've just spent so much time on this complicated middle game that I like, I'm just like, I don't want to calculate. I don't want to, like, the game's over. Like, that, that's that's obviously not the right way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, you, you you will lose a lot of points um, with that, and that's what's kind of happened um, happened to many players, you know, my, myself included. Um, so yeah, I'll just show you this one example here. This was my game against Grandmaster uh, Ir Malinsky from from last turn, an open tournament. Um, and yeah, I played a really good game. I was um, winning this one. Uh, although it was kind of like uh, I was winning, then we had a drawn end game, and then I was winning again. Um, but anyway, critical moment ends up right around 
uh, in this position and I'm, I'm playing black. Um, I guess I have like maybe two minutes here with, with the 30 second increment. Um, and I'd already seen, let's say two winning options. And I just went with this one um, where like, okay, my king stops the G pawn and then the two pawns kind of promote against white's bishop. I, I thought like the game is basically over. Uh, so he goes king f3. I push a3. He goes g7. I gotta go king f7. And like only now I realize like, well, on, on king e2, I actually don't have a good pawn move because the bishop is coming to a2 with check. So the idea was like c2 resigns. <laughs> Bishop takes c2, a2, right? It's just game over. But he has check and king d2, and I just don't hold on to the pawns. And uh, game drawn. Uh, and like, I guess the real painful thing was that I had already seen before playing a4 that another way to win <laughs> would be to go knight a6 with a much more straightforward approach of just bringing the knight to b4 and pushing c2 and immediately collecting white's bishop. And this one can get a little bit close, but it's the line's pretty direct. Basically, white will have to give up the piece and he can try to go after the a pawn. Um, but if there's one thing you know about this kind of position is that if the knight can defend the pawn from behind, then it's over because white, the king just can't do anything. Can't take the knight, can't take the pawn, so black just has all the time in the world to take the g-pawn, come back, and, and win slowly. So, yeah, it was one of those things where it's like, well, I have two ways of winning the game. Let's choose so like, you you say... know, the simpler one. And yeah, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering if you would say your mistake was that, like, did you, did you calculate a long line after a4 and think that you were winning? Or did you just think like in your head oh the two pawns against the bishop is winning and not calculate it yeah you know i just kind of like approximated it so what i saw was like i play a4 um we'll just use arrows oops uh he's gonna go here or you know that's his only move because he he has to get the king back um a3 and then it's like right if he goes here then i win with c2 and if he goes g7, well, then just king f7, that's nothing, right? And so I just didn't really combine the lines together. So it was just a very approximate, like, oh, well, g7, I always have king f7, that's nothing. And as soon as he approaches with the king, well, the pawns just promote on their own. I don't even need the knight. So I just wasn't being, like, move by move precise. Um, which, okay, I only had two minutes, but, like, you know, uh, it's all relative. Like, at my level, this is something I, I should have been able to to see. Uh, and I should have seen it uh, earlier. And it's like, yeah, I just relaxed at, like, the last possible moment, and that's it. Uh, half point gone <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in an open tournament. You know, like, a you know, big, big half point. Um, so I guess the point is, like, this obviously happens to everyone of all levels, and there's no like, there's no magic recipe for it, but it's just uh, as much as you can, you got to try to like be conscious about it and just remind yourself like, you know, there's always ways to go wrong and there's always resources. And um, well, the, the Russian logic that I've heard is when you have a winning position, you basically have to like double down on your energy. You have to counterbalance the body's natural uh desire to to relax actually it's very simple i when i like i play one season of little league but i remember they taught us that when you're running to first base you always run past first base you don't run to the base you run past it so they don't slow down uh once you get there and i think it's kind of the same thing you gotta just as you just basically have to push yourself to, to stay focused as much as you can uh, especially during uh an otb game um well, all right, Scott. So yeah, I feel like we got we got a nice picture of like your games and and where you're at. It's clear that like you know you just haven't been playing for that long. So there's a lot of positions you don't have a lot of experience in, you haven't been exposed to, um, and there's definitely a lot for you to like 
to to look at. Um, actually, one thing I, I wanted to talk about, but we haven't, let me ask you about it now, is um, how do you work on your tactics and your calculation? Um, so mostly using like online tactics trainers. Um, I've, I mean, I've used a combination of like a thousand different tactics trainers. So apps on my phone called CT art. Oh yeah. I like CT art. Um, which I like that. Um, like chess.com, Lee chess tactics, things like that. Um, uh, yeah, I've you... used some I use books with like the difficult problems up on the board and calculating. Wait, what was the name of the book you just mentioned? Oh sorry, I, I didn't I didn't name any. I've used those uh the the Russian um whatever the, the manual of chess positions. Oh, those are bit, great. But I haven't, I haven't um, done enough of them. I don't think. Mm. Okay. I gotcha. Um, do you use, do you use CTR much? Uh, the app? I haven't been using it recently uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, I was on a good kick with it for maybe two months and then I kind of fell by the wayside. Okay. I got you. So yeah, like my main, feeling on like tactics and calculation is you have your your simple tactics or pattern recognition and and for that I think CTR is great because it just drills you in all the different um, patterns and like variations on those um, and then once you're ready to start training for like your uh, OTB like tournaments um, then you'll want to incorporate some over the board solving where you're setting up positions you know from a book or actually some people they just do it on chessable and they get a book on Chessable and then they set it up on their board and they just make it so that the time is like unlimited, uh, which I think is totally fine too, because Chessable is nice. You know, you get to track your, your progress and stuff. Um, yeah, so you'll mm -hmm. definitely want to do some kind of deeper like OTB solving once you're ready to like start training for, uh, for tournaments. Um, whatever you do, I would recommend like sticking to it and trying to be, you know, consistent, like at least for like four weeks. Um, and then maybe moving away to something if, if you aren't enjoying it or if you're not feeling like, you know, pumped about it. Um, but obviously that's like just super important part of, of chess, uh, just for everyone, uh, just working on your like tactics and, and, and calculation. I didn't get the feeling that you're, uh, like, like weak tactically or anything like that. It's just, it's just something every, everyone has to work on. Yeah, uh, and it's one of the main things you know that separates players of different levels. Even if you know the opening more than someone, if they can just out calculate you, you know you're you're still a big underdog uh, in the game. Um, so okay, right. So my feeling overall is like, yeah, you essentially need a lot more uh, experience when it when it comes to like playing different positions. Um, I would actually encourage you to play. Uh, a decent amount of blitz just in the um in the interest of getting experience in your opening as long as you're like reviewing every blitz game and kind of analyzing your opening decisions especially like up to let's say move 15 or 20 beyond that okay it's a blitz game like you're gonna hang pieces mm -hmm. your opponent will hang stuff like whatever that's fine but just evaluating your decisions out of the opening move 15 to 20 be really useful for you because like this is where you test your understanding, right? Are you able to find the right move in a short time control? Um, and then you can learn a little bit from each game. You know, your opponent plays something weird. You didn't react to it correctly. You look up what to do. Now you know. Next game, same thing, different line. And slowly over time, you like build up your knowledge and your experience this way. Um, in addition, of course, choosing like a player or two that you really like and trying to model um, your approach based on them, I think would be really useful. You don't necessarily have to like copy their openings or anything, but just kind of trying to see how they approach different positions might give you an idea, or you might not connect with them whatsoever and move on to someone else. That would be totally fine too. Um, but usually, yeah, a lot of people, they find one player they really like and, and they kind of study all their games and they 
uh, get a sense for for their style and and their openings. Um, that I think would be really useful for you in terms of picking up nuances, um, studying annotated games where they discuss the you know why they made certain opening and middle game decisions. Uh, I think this would be really uh, really critical. Um, and then when it comes to the end game, I, I don't feel like you actually have to study a lot. I think you'll get this just from looking at games. But of course, the the mindset and like yeah, the the attitude mm. that we talked about, like just trying to be fully focused 100 percent of the time, this will probably just give you the most the most game is like being able to um to uh, to stay at a high high energy for for the the full game. Yeah, make, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I don't know how to prioritize everything, uh, um, but, but uh, yeah, but well, you sense. know, choose I think the one thing. Of the big right takeaways is I, I think I do need to. Yeah. Oh wait, I missed the last part. It's I think, cut off. Oh, I do need sorry. to. Um, <laughs> Yeah, to uh, I think I need to just like to add the the, the game studies and, and to pick up ideas that way and yeah, right. Well, yeah, choose the thing you know you're most excited about and and then do it consistently. If you want to work on your calculation, then do that like forty five minutes for a day, four to six weeks. Um, if you want to like yeah enhance your game study, then like study three games every day and put those three games in like a Lee Chess database and, you know, hold yourself accountable. Three games a day, you can add to your database and just keep it like very simple to follow, you know, exactly like how to accomplish the goal. It's very easy to do. And then at the end, you feel super accomplished, like 50 games that you've now played through and maybe added some notes yourself. Um, and then you can play through again, you know, to maximize your your retention. I think that would be, um, that. that's also another great approach uh, as well. Um, well, cool, Scott. I, I hope this was useful for you. And uh, the idea yeah. here is is to actually like check back in, like uh, I think in a couple months, and, and see how you're doing. Um, so we'll we'll catch up with you. Also hold you accountable to to work on your chess yeah. uh, for the yeah. time being. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for for coming on. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me. This has been uh, been really fun and and uh, very helpful. So thanks a lot. Absolutely. All right, guys.